in full household moves in the process of uh, my service time. And um, your military career really started with the U.S. Military Academy. That's correct. That's and correct. Since you're going to be the first interview that I've done with somebody who went through the Military Academy, tell us something about what that was like. I'm sure it was an amazing experience. It was. It was. We entered uh, my class of 1959, entered on the 3rd of July of uh, 1955. Uh, I went straight out of high school. Some of the, some of my classmates went through a, a prep school uh, before uh, going to West Point and some actually had prior service. Uh, but we entered with a class of 729. Uh, interesting introductory uh, briefing because uh, the briefer said uh, as we entered and as we were all sitting in a large auditorium said look to your left and look to your right because one of the three of you is not going to be here in four years. That turned out to be just about right because when we graduated in 1959 we graduated 499 so we lost uh, about 230 from 729 to 499. And most of those were due to academics. Uh, to say that it was a fun time would probably not be totally accurate, uh, but to say that it was certainly uh, four of the most important years that, and most productive and most formulative years that I've ever spent uh, in my life. It, uh, it truly shaped uh, my future, not only because it put me in the U.S. Army, uh, but because it uh, shaped my thinking and, uh, and values uh, in the process. Now, what um, um, course of study, did, do you pick a course of study, or is it a, a general course of study for cadets at, at West Point? At the time I entered, it was a general course of, of study. Uh, the only choice of subjects that you had was which foreign language you wanted to study for two years. Now it is much more open. Uh, there are, I believe, about 40 majors uh, that the cadets can choose from. There are uh, dozens of electives uh, that they can choose from. And it's much more like a typical uh, college atmosphere as far as the academic uh, courses that are available are concerned. Excuse me. Upon your graduation, um, were you able to choose which direction in the U.S. Army you went in, or was that chosen for you? We were able to choose. <clears throat> Actually, it was based on uh, where you stood within the class. Uh, at again, during my tenure there, uh, all of the cadet grades were were tracked on a, a weekly basis. The class standings were calculated uh, on a regular basis. And at the time of graduation, uh, you chose your branch and your first assignment based on where you stood within the class order of merit. Uh, today it's much more oriented toward an uh, alphabetic uh, distribution. So in your time it wasn't good to be at the bottom of the class? It was not. Well, <laughs> unless you were going to be at the very bottom. Right. Uh, and the last man was always considered to be very important and at graduation time uh, he got as big a cheer as the first man and in fact it was customary to uh, take a, a donation uh, of a dollar from each of the members of the class which was then presented to the last man which was who was known as the goat of the class. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> from, uh, <clears throat> from the point in time you graduated what did you move on to, uh, to doing? Uh, I was fortunate enough to get my first choice of, uh, of branches which was the Corps of Engineers and my first choice of assignments, which was uh, Hawaii. Uh, so we were stationed there for the first three years. After finishing, the first order of business uh, after graduation was to go to uh, the branch school, 
uh, to learn the technicalities of, uh, of, the partic of each of the branches. I went to the Corps of Engineers School at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And then I wanted to be in Army Aviation. So I uh, then went to uh, flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama uh, in fixed wing airplanes at that point in time. I later qualified in helicopters as well. And in Hawaii, uh, the first real assignment, we arrived there in 1960, which was the year immediately after statehood. So the state was relatively unspoiled. Uh, we uh, lived on the, on the beach of the North Shore of Oahu because there was insufficient military housing available on the base at Schofield Barracks. And I had two uh, very different assignments while I was there. The first one was with the aviation company, the Division Aviation Company of the 25th Infantry Division. I was uh, flying fixed wing airplanes as an artillery spotter uh, and did that for the first year and a half or two years of my uh, assignment in Hawaii and then I moved over to the Combat Engineer uh, Battalion, the 65th Combat Engineer Battalion, which supported the 25th Infantry Division. Uh, where I was initially a platoon leader and then uh, was a company commander of uh, one of the companies of that battalion. Now by this time, were you, were you still a lieutenant or had you advanced to uh... I became a, uh, a captain. I was promoted to captain just at the end of that uh, right. assignment period. And um, <clears throat> when you were in Hawaii during that period of time, um, what, what things did you do outside of uh, your, the requirements of your military service? In terms of what did you do for fun or what did you do to keep yourself uh, occupied? We had two children. Uh, oh, so which, you had married by that time? Yes, okay. yes. I married immediately after uh, graduation from okay. West Point. Uh, the, the wedding was not at West Point. It was in our hometown in Missouri. But uh, we were married when we started my career in the service. And uh, we had two children born in Hawaii at Tripler Army Hospital. The assignment there was very interesting because uh, the division was the uh, ready uh, division for activities in the Far East. And in fact, uh, there were battalions that would be deployed to unknown locations over in the Far East from time to time. Uh, this was in the early 1960s. I was there 60 to 63. So uh, we spent a lot of time training in the jungles of, uh, Hawaii, of Oahu. Uh, I joke, but not, it's not really a joke. Uh, we, I was assigned there for 36 months and I was in the field for 18 of those 36, uh, within sight of home, but not able to go home at night. So uh, that was a very interesting and, and uh, challenging experience. We worked uh, five and a half days a week. We had uh, full field layout inspections on Saturday mornings for all of the officers of the aviation company were included in that full field layout. And uh, then in the Corps of Engineers, we did training for the type of thing that we might have to do uh, if we were deployed to uh, the Far East. And was that um, usually <clears throat> structural work in the field to support the troops or? Uh, it, <clears throat> In the aviation uh, end of it, it was uh, flying activity and uh, for uh, mock exercises, right. uh, division exercises in support of them. And engineers, uh, there was always engineering work to be done on the, the roads and trails and culverts and uh, that sort of thing in the hills of, uh, of Oahu. So, some of so it was practical in, right. in that sense. Now, 
Now, um, you had also mentioned that um, in fixed wing uh, aircraft you were doing spotting. Um, what did that end? What did that entail? Practice, fortunately, <laughs> uh, but there is, <clears throat> is an artillery range uh, on the island of Oahu. Uh, up near Kolekole Pass, uh, where the invasion uh, entered, uh, leading to Pearl Harbor. Right. And uh, we would direct the artillery fire to the targets that were uh, there in the artillery range, uh, never engaged in any right. actual firefights with people shooting so back. but. Your function was to spot the targets so that they knew what they were firing. Right, and then adjust the uh, firing right or left in a longer range or a shorter range so that right. they would hit the target. And so time time not in the field doing that, you, you were able to spend with your family? Yes, yeah. And Houston military... Um, military no, military. actually we uh, rented our own house. Uh, on the North Shore of Hawaii because the military didn't have sufficient housing available. But that had its benefits uh, also because uh, we literally were on the beach and could walk out the, the front door and be in the sand. And I'm, I'm guessing it's nowhere, was nowhere near as developed as it is. Not even yeah. close, not even close. No, it was uh, the road leading from Schofield Barracks to Haleiwa, the name of the town where, where we lived, was a two-lane, uh, narrow road. It's now four lanes, uh, uh, interstate, right. and uh, it was very rural. There was a lot of pineapple farms. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of pineapple farms, which have now disappeared. There was sugarcane uh, farms, uh, which has now disappeared. And uh, it's a much different, much more developed, and uh, so, and and while we lived there, the tallest building on Waikiki Beach was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which is a small four-story pink hotel, which is now hard to find among the. I've, I, I've actually flown in and out of. Uh Honolulu a Heavy. few years back, and it just, it's mind-boggling to fly in there and see the, the city. Right. It just doesn't look like it fits the location. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. So you have had a chance to go back and uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, your we've and gone stuff. back several times, and in fact, we prefer the other islands, uh, right. Maui and uh, Kauai, uh, much more than Oahu now. Mm -hmm. And um, upon, upon completion <clears throat> of um, your three years there, uh, what was your next assignment? I came back from there and uh, changed branches at that point in time. The, at that point in time, the Corps of Engineers and aviation were not compatible uh, because the Corps of Engineers said, uh, we're not going to send you to graduate school because you already have a specialty. It's called aviation. and. If you're an officer in the Corps of Engineers and you don't go to graduate school, uh, your career is essentially limited. Mm -hmm. So I changed uh, branches at that time uh, and went into the Transportation Corps, which was much more compatible with aviation. And in fact, they had the responsibility for aviation maintenance and supply. Uh, they sent me to graduate school. Uh, I went to MIT. Uh, for the master's degree in aeronautical engineering and uh, had a two-year program laid out to get the master's degree. Uh, got a call from uh, Washington, the personnel assignments people, saying we need more people in Vietnam. Can you finish up your degree in 12 months? And the answer was no because the courses that were needed to get the degree were not offered uh, during the 12-month period that they were talking about. But I did finish up in 15 months and then went uh, to helicopter transition uh, and then to Vietnam in mid-1966. I was there. I'm 
I'm sorry, go ahead. I was there, that was my first tour in Vietnam. That was uh, mid-66 to mid-67. <clears throat> and my assignment there was with a research and development organization uh, known as the Army Con Concept Team in Vietnam, ACTIVE. We did, uh, we received experimental equipment from various manufacturers in the United States, such as night vision devices, the early night vision devices, which are very common uh, place today, uh, manpack ra radars, uh, smoke generators or gas generators to uh, try to flush the uh, Viet Cong out of the tunnels and other uh, leading edge state-of-the-art uh, equipment like that, which we would then distribute primarily to the special forces camps, which were on the Cambodian border, but also uh, to some of the infantry divisions that were there. Uh, they would use them for a while. We would make trips uh, and visit with them, get, get data from them and their comments, what needed to be improved, uh, what was okay, and if it was a useful piece of equipment, then we would uh, try to very quickly get it uh, sent from the United States and distributed to, uh, to the troops. So, and, and that tour was spent largely flying helicopters to and, and from the special forces camps and to the other divisions. I covered almost all of Vietnam from uh, Way Phu Bai uh, in the north to uh, Vung Tau and uh, other places in the, uh, in the Delta. And which, uh, what type of choppers were you It was the uh, Huey, okay. the UH-1 at that point in time. And the uh, so that was certainly an interesting uh, and challenging time and got to see a lot of the country of Vietnam. Uh, I remarked at that time, if, if Vietnam could ever get their act together, it would be a great vacation spot because they had some beautiful stretches of beach. Right. And from what I hear, they have gotten their act together and it is a uh, preferred vacation spot. I have not been back. It's been on my to-do list. It's still on my to-do list. And we actually had a trip scheduled at one point in time and had to cancel it uh, because of some surgery that I needed to have done. But it's still there and we'll get back. So this, this initial, the initial time that you were there, were we fully involved? Um, fighting there, or is this still at the ramp-up stage? Of the no, 66 and 67 was, uh, was fully involved. Okay. Uh, perhaps this is a good place to interject uh, also. <clears throat> because of the timing, uh, many of my classmates, the 499 who graduated and were commissioned, uh, saw early assignments in Vietnam. Uh, we lost uh, 15 uh, of my classmates over there. The first in 1962, so the right. fighting was fully engaged, and the last in 1969. Uh, in 1966 and 67, we were there and you got, the feeling was that there's still a way to win this war. Uh, and people were searching uh, for the way to, to win the war. Uh, my second tour in 1971 was different in that you could sense that people were realizing, authorities were realizing that there was not a, winnable, uh, not a way to win the war. And it had become more a case of how do we evacuate while losing the fewest additional troops? Okay. That was the sense that you got that wasn't published. How did that feel for you given all of your training um, at the 
cadmium and, and up to that point in time, the, the drastic uh, shift in, in the role we were playing there. And yeah. Well, it was, of course, disappointing, but from my perspective, I had a job to do while I was there, and uh, that occupied me full time. Uh, didn't spend a lot of time you know, lamenting the fact that uh, we were trying to get out. It was just uh, planning for the retrograde of, uh, of the helicopters. We had 3,000 helicopters over there in 1971, and I jump from 67 to 71 here, but I'll go back and fill that in maybe. Okay. Uh, but in, in 71, uh, I was in the Transportation Corps, as I said, and was uh, assigned to play coup in the Central Highlands uh, to command a uh, aircraft maintenance and supply company. Uh, we supported uh, a number of helicopters from the uh, Combat Aviation Battalion, which was based at uh, Camp Holloway, uh, Play Coup. And uh, I commanded the company for w 604th Transportation Company, which was a unit of the 14th uh, Transportation Battalion. Commanded that for six months, which was the program at that time. They would bring in new people to get command experience you would command for six months and then turn it over to somebody else and move on to go uh, do another job. Uh, my job after commanding the 604th was with the group headquarters, the 34th General Support Group headquarters in Saigon. And uh, there I was initially the aircraft maintenance officer for all of the aircraft in Vietnam, and then uh, the director of planning and operations. And part of my job as a director of planning and operations was to put in place the plans <clears throat> to evacuate the aircraft when the time came, which meant that they all had to be preserved. Each one had to be preserved because you were then put on ships and if they were exposed to the salt water directly, uh, salt air uh, directly, then you know, there'd be enormous corrosion problems and, and a lot of work to do. So they were all cocooned. And so we had to plan for the several locations that would do the cocooning because you can only cocoon so many aircraft a day. Right. I can uh, that so, and it was a very interesting and, and challenging uh, task, which was ultimately implemented after I left, uh, and they got all, all of the aircraft out uh, in a very short period of time. While you while you were in Saigon, um, just out of curiosity, what was the environment like um, with everything that was going on there? The the first assignment. Uh, in 66 and 67, I was also, the headquarters was in Saigon. And we used to, you know, I lived in a uh, BOQ, uh, officer's quarters uh, in Sholan, outside of uh, Saigon actually. And we used to regularly have uh, car bombs drove, driven into the, the BOQ buildings and blow up suicide missions. The damage that was done to people usually, to the people living there, if there were people there at the time of the bombing, was glass fragments uh, flying all over the place and, and uh, we did have several people injured but, uh, but not killed due to car bombs. Uh, over the course of the 12 months, there were several of those. Uh, we got better at uh, building barricades and that sort of thing to keep the car bombs out. The second time, uh, when I came to Saigon after uh, the assignment in Play Coup, uh, the town was less unfriendly, I would say. Um, and 
although there were the occasions when there were riots in the streets and, and that sort of thing, uh, it wasn't as prevalent as it was in 60, in 66 and 7. Of course, that was the time of the Tet Offensive right. also. So, uh, Did you get a feeling from um, the, the Vietnamese themselves that uh, they sensed that it was going well or going poorly for them as, as well as, as our forces? Or um, were you just so focused on what you had to do that you, you didn't really get exposed to that? I didn't really get a sense uh, from them. Uh, you know, they were so, the, the people that you would see were, were so poor right. uh, and living in such squalor uh, that I don't think they, right. they wished it was over, but. Uh, with all, all things considered, they had seen nothing but war since World War II. So. Right, right. But uh, it was good for their restaurants uh, because the uh, the GIs would come in and right. and have uh, have a meal. Uh, it was good for their bars. Uh, so in many ways, uh, those who were involved in that end of the business, uh, it was good for the laundry women, uh, the women who did the laundry, and the the people who cleaned up the uh, the BOQs. But uh, you know, for the for the rank and file of the people, uh, it was a very challenge, challenging uh, situation, I would say. Well, you also um, a little while back mentioned uh, from your graduating class that uh, I believe it was 15 right. were lost. Were they in various, um, various I want to say theaters, but in various capacities, or were they mostly ground? Uh, with the ground forces? There, there were some in the Air Force. There were some uh, flying with Army Aviation. Uh, the majority, as you would expect, were in the ground forces. One of the uh, 15 uh, was awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously. Uh, he was captured and was in a uh, a prison camp uh, in North Vietnam and he was such a rebel uh, I mean he, re he refused to give in to them and he would encourage his comrades in the prison camp uh, to sing and uh, the Star Spangled Banner and other patriotic songs from time to time and the North, Vietn North Vietnamese finally assassinated him uh, because of that. He was uh, just recently awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And we have one other Congressional Medal of Honor winner who, in the class who uh, served in Vietnam and, and got out alive. But, uh, now, did you ever at any time uh, in your I don't want to say travels, but movement around the country. Were you ever under fire uh, from the, the Viet Cong? I'm sure I was. <laughs> I was never hit. Right. Uh, but uh, the areas that you fly over uh, naturally say that uh, you're going to be under fire uh, while you're while you're flying. But unless the bullets hit the uh, the helicopter, you didn't really know it. While I was in uh, Pleiku commanding the 604th uh, company there, uh, we did have uh, rocket attacks on our facility and also mortar attacks from time to time. Uh, again, fortunately, the VC were bad shots, uh, so uh, they didn't do any terrific damage. Now, how um Certainly, I'm, I'm sure you were able to communicate with your family while you were there. Um, how, how was that uh, experience for them, considering they knew that the dangers that you were exposed to? Well, for Nancy, it was a very challenging experience, I'm sure. Uh, was she in Hawaii during the, this time? No, the, the first time uh, in 66 and 7, 
she was uh, moved back to Sedalia, Missouri, uh, where her parents and my parents were both located at the time. And uh, it was helpful you know, having two small kids for her to have that sort of support. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I'm sure she had her moments of concern, but raising two kids keeps you uh, busy, keeps you occupied. occupied. And uh, you know, we communicated by uh, taped messages primarily because making a telephone call fell into the too hard uh, category. I had to schedule it and, right. and uh, the communication was not always uh, clear uh, and it was on a radio, uh, uh, so it was, you know, I love you over, <laughs> I love you too over, and uh, right. that sort of c conversation. The second time, uh, we, well, between the, the two tours in, in Vietnam, after the first one, I uh, came back to the United States and was uh, I applied for and was fortunate to be selected for the uh, uh, to attend the Navy test pilot school at Patuxent River, Maryland, and I went through that and was assigned as a research test pilot with uh, NASA out at uh, Moffett Naval Air Station in uh, San Jose, California. So we lived in San Jose for. Uh, about a little over two years and then I was asked to go back to to Vietnam uh, for the second tour. Uh, we had a house there and uh, Nancy and, and the kids were in school by this time. Uh, Nancy and the kids stayed there. I have two children by the way. Uh, Nancy and the two children stayed in California during uh, that absence in 1971. Tell us a little bit about the, the in-between period. That sounded interesting with the, the test pilot program. Were you actually testing aircraft, or were you uh, involved more of the engineering side of it? Or? No, I was actually a test pilot. Wow. Uh, the, the Army uses the Navy uh, test pilot school at Patuxent uh, to train their test pilots. Uh, in, each class that goes through uh, at that point in time had uh, three or four Army students in addition to the, the Navy students and the uh, Marines, some foreign students. Mm -hmm. Was there any competition it's, between the, the branches of service? Well, there, in, in effect there is because they, the, the staff of the test pilot school uh, gives an award at the end of at graduation time uh, to uh, what they call the distinguished graduate and that is the, uh, the, the person who has collectively the highest grades uh, for written uh, reports and that sort of thing and tests and uh, the highest grades for flying. So. Uh, you know, whether that goes to an Army student or to a Navy student is right. a bit of a, a bit of a competition. So what, the biggest competition is to be sure to graduate. Right. Well, what type of aircraft um, during that period of time were you testing? Well, at the, at the test pilot school uh, itself, <clears throat> I f flew helicopters and fixed wing airplanes. Uh, the helicopters that they had were a Huey and a SH-3 uh, and uh, then the fixed wing airplanes that they had were uh, a couple of Army airplanes, uh, a U-6 Beaver and an O-1 Otter, which are single engine reciprocating uh, engine airplanes. But also, uh, I was able to be checked out in Navy uh, airplanes, uh, the, the uh, jets as well as uh, propeller airplanes. So I flew the, the, 
Navy T-1 uh, and the Navy A-4 attack airplane, which was interesting because it was the first single-seat jet airplane that I had ever flown. And they give you the book and say, read it, and when you think you're ready, right. uh, let us know. So, so that was exciting and a challenge. It must have been interesting, the, the difference between flying a helicopter and flying a jet. Oh, it is. Yeah. The, the functionality of each one is so radically different. Right. And then when I was uh, with NASA out uh, at Moffett, the air, airplanes <coughs> excuse me, that we flew were part of the NASA stable, uh, by and large. Uh, flew the uh, de Havilland uh, Buffalo, which was a four-engine uh, airplane that the uh, two engine, sorry, uh, four engine uh, airplane that the Army turned over to uh, to NASA, and it was two engine. And also, uh, we had a Learjet uh, that we used to take uh, astronomers up uh, to very high altitudes so they could do uh, work there above the uh, tropopause. And uh, flew a number of different types of airplane. In fact, uh, flew uh, a vertical takeoff and landing uh, machine known as the uh, X-22. Uh, it's a ducted fan uh, machine that has four fans, uh, two forward and two aft and it takes off vertically and then the fans transition right. so that it can fly horizontally. Uh, so similar to the Harrier, British Harrier? Same, con same right. idea, uh, different implementation of the vertical takeoff uh, capability. And um, after that period of time you went back to Vietnam in 71. Right. Um, flying during that time or more uh, strategic planning and uh, I know you're talking about um, Cocooning the aircraft yeah. to get them out of there. Also flew because, uh, well, from the, from the 604th, we had to fly wherever we wanted to go, uh, whether it was the battalion headquarters, at, uh, which was located at Tuiwa, or uh, to our supported units uh, out, in, you know, out in the field. So uh, there was flying associated there. Uh, and then at the group headquarters in Saigon, it was a combination of uh, helicopters and fixed-wing airplanes, uh, depending on how far we were going uh, on a particular uh, particular mission. Uh, for example, one of the trips I had to make was to one of one of the divisions. Uh, the Americal division was getting ready to. Uh, depart and they were located at a base on the shore uh, further north uh, up toward uh, Da Nang and in that area south of Da Nang actually I think but a typhoon came through and did enormous damage to the to the helicopter fleet uh, that was there those that were outside some of them got the blades ripped off uh, and they made a heroic effort to get the helicopters into a hangar uh, to protect them, uh, which turned out to be unfortunate because it, when the typhoon came through, it created a low pressure inside the hangar and caused the hangar to collapse on top of all the helicopters that were in there. So there was extensive, extensive damage. And I had to go up there and, and determine what sort of a uh, repair team uh, or evacuation team uh, we would provide uh, to help them with the situation. So it was a combination of flying of fixed wing and, and helicopters during you that were there time. For a year during that, that tour. Yes. And, and Six months each place, right? And what did you do um, after that tour ended? What uh, was your next assignment? After that tour, uh, I came back uh, to 
United States and was assigned to uh, West Point in a uh, teaching job. I taught uh, fluid mechanics and thermodynamics. Uh, That's a fun class. <laughs> it is. It's not one of the cadets' favorite, either, either one of them are not uh, favorite uh, classes for the cadets, unless they're really interested in science. Right. And uh, the cadets who take those courses are juniors in their junior year, uh, which is uh, a fun year to, uh, to be able to teach. You know, the first year they're kind of odd and they're finding their way around and they have no personality. Uh, the second year, uh, they've got it all by the tail and so that, you know, they're not really serious, many of them, I'm generalizing. Uh, but by the third year, uh, their personalities start to come out and they're serious about uh, studying. By the fourth year, they're concentrating on where their first job is going to be and getting married and, you know, have other distractions. Now, was this at the point in time where they started having, they had already moved from a general course of study to more um, specialized? Yes, to electives. And I did teach one of the electives uh, also, which was uh, aerodynamics and stability and control of uh, airplanes mm -hmm. and helicopters. And you had your family back, back east yeah. with you by that time. Yeah. And teaching was one of the most satisfying jobs and also one of the most challenging jobs, uh, I would say, that, uh, that I had during my Army career. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's some really sharp students uh, in those classes, and you, know, you need to stay ahead of them. Right. So, might be a silly question, but I'm going to ask you. Okay. Was that at or about the time that Petraeus was going through the academy, or did he already pass through? Because I know uh, it seems like the right time frame. But yeah, this was uh, 72 through 74 okay. that I was there. So, so it might have been a little early. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. Because he seems to have become one of the more storied uh, graduates. Right, right. He, I was at a football game last weekend and he was there oh. for his 35th reunion. So let's see. That would actually give us a timeline. Right. Uh, so 2009 five. minus 35 is... Yeah, it's, he was there before that. Well, it would have put him in the class of 74, right? If my quick math is right. That sounds right. So he may have been there, but... Uh, he, he, he may have taken it, but not from me. He would have taken it because he uh, didn't have a choice. Right, that was a requirement. Yeah. Well, I know from my For those in the science right. track. And I, my brother's an engineer, and I've heard horror stories about when he had to take it. But mm. He didn't manage to get an A, so I guess he figured things out. He figured things out, right. <laughs> so, um, after after the the years you taught there, um, did you go to your final assignment, or did you have a few more after that? I had another one in between. Uh, went to the uh, Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, and then went from there to uh, the Pentagon, uh, which I stretched into a five-year tour. It's normally three or four years. Uh, but I had decided earlier on that I was going to retire after, from the Army after the Pentagon, and that would be my final assignment. So I extended uh, so that uh, both of our children could finish high school in the same, right. same school uh, in Virginia while I was at the Pentagon. But I had a number of interesting jobs in the Pentagon. Uh, when I first went there, I was, well, <clears throat> I was assigned to the research, let's see, Office of, of the Chief of Staff for Research Development and Ac Acquisition. They changed it so frequently that I, right. 
but that was uh, Desrata, it was called Deputy Chief of Staff for Research Development and Acquisition. And I was in the aviation systems uh, part of that, uh, aviation systems division of that. My first job was uh, the basic to, to obtain and, and allocate the funds for basic research and development uh, and uh, prototype uh, aircraft, uh, experimental type aircraft, which sort of fit in right with my uh, test pilot training and also my graduate degree in aero and uh, aeronautics. And I did that for a while and then uh, there are individual officers within uh, the division who are responsible for each developing aircraft. <clears throat> and I uh, had two of those during my assignment there. The first was for a, a new scout helicopter for the Army and then finally uh, for the advanced attack helicopter which is the attack helicopter that's in service with the Army now. Wow. So that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and did you, have, did you have the option of staying in the military longer? Or, uh, had you decided to do so? Or? Yes. And in fact, I was on orders for an assignment in Germany to command a uh, transportation aircraft maintenance battalion. And I was also, it, I came out on the promotion list for uh, full Colonel 06 uh, after I mm -hmm. decided to retire. But uh, if uh, there, there are certain milestones <clears throat> that uh, you meet within the service, and I had 21 years if if I had accepted the promotion to colonel, then it would have taken me to 26 years with the uh, obligatory service requirement. Right. And once you're at 26 years, you just as well stay for 30, uh, because that's sort of the next break point. And I figured that you know, because of the career path that I had chosen, I might make one star, but that would be the end of it. Uh, and I figured also that my whatever skills I had were much more marketable at age 42 uh, when I decided to retire than they would have been at age 52. Uh, and so it, it turned out to be the best, best possible uh, choice. And um, once retired, what did you move into from there? I had had the opportunity to look at uh, and visit all of the helicopter manufacturing companies uh, in the United States uh, as a result of my time in the Pentagon. So, uh, you know, I applied to, I sent my resume uh, to a uh, Washington based think tank uh, and some other places, but I only sent it to one helicopter company, and that was Sikorsky Aircraft. And I had not, while I was in the Pentagon, I had not worked directly with any of their, with the Black Hawk, uh, which was the primary contract that the Army had uh, with Sikorsky. So I didn't have a uh, conflict of, of interest issue, uh, and I also liked what I saw at Sikorsky. I thought they had a future. I think you got it right that time. <laughs> I didn't stop. That's okay. Did I be in there? It adds to the so. posterity of the <laughs> That's okay. We've had dogs barking. And we've had uh, some. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you ever met George Lorison? No. Uh, his wife actually came in and introduced herself to everyone and sat down right next to him. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> well, my dog doesn't bark, fortunately. <laughs> so, uh, so where was I? Yeah. 
with Sikorsky? Right. I, I decided uh, that I would go with Sikorsky if they would uh, offer me a job, and they did. I started there uh, as in the program management uh, area, and they put me toward a Navy program so that there would be no appearance even of conflict of interest. I became the program manager for the Navy Seahawk, which is a uh, derivative of, of the Black Hawk helicopter. I did that, uh, and we developed the, uh, the new CV Hilo, uh, which is a carrier-based uh, sonar uh, aircraft, uh, dipping sonar. And then uh, I was named a vice president uh, responsible for manufacturing at the plant. And I did that for about a year, and then they asked me to become the vice president of engineering, which I had you know, some background for as a result of my uh, engineering training. From there, uh, I moved into the international arena and was responsible for our business development activities in Australia and Korea and Turkey and uh, Republic of China right. and uh, Greece, not all at the same time, but uh, in sequentially and usually a couple of them at I the same time. A, I actually knew a fellow back in the late 80s uh, who was in the Australian Air Force who was uh, situated at Sikorsky. Oh, yeah? I guess evaluating they had a team that came over as we were building, as we were developing uh, their helicopter. Yeah, I was the program manager at that time. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, they're a very difficult customer, very challenging customer, very demanding. Uh, and then uh, I took over the responsibility for all international business development and finally uh, a year or so before I retired, uh, had the responsibility for the U.S. government business development as well as international. So uh, it was a great ride, and uh, I'm glad I did it the way I did it. Uh, you know, with I spent 22 years uh, working for Sikorsky, so I had two 20-year careers, and uh, so now looking forward to it. That's, that's what brought you to Connecticut. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, we did not live in Connecticut. We were born in Sedalia, Missouri. But that's what brought us to Connecticut. And interesting that we live in Madison because I, I did, like most people do, drew a circle around the plant and said, <laughs> live inside that circle. Right. And Nancy was with a realtor, and uh, we looked inside that circle and found some places that we could live. But he said uh, to her one day, he said, you know, I told, you told me only inside the circle, but the last people I didn't show this area to got really upset with me. So just humor me and let's spend a day and drive to Guilford and Madison. And uh, she was hooked. <laughs> so we live in Madison. It'd be very difficult to get us out now. I know the feeling. <laughs> uh, and then I retired in... 2002, after 20 years, 22 years with uh, Sikorsky, and now we enjoy traveling and uh, being with the grandkids. And do you think Do you think you'll get a chance to get back to uh, Vietnam if, if the opportunity presents itself? Oh yeah, we were actually uh, booked on a cruise, and we're looking for the right one uh, to go again. Uh, and they, they usually make a couple of stops in uh, Vietnam, uh, Hanoi, and which I had no desire to go to while I was in the service, believe me, um, and uh, a couple of, uh, of other sp right. stops. They change it, but they all stop in Ho, Ho Chi Minh City uh, as well, Saigon. A um, little bit of a, a step to the side. Uh, I was curious uh, to find out, um, certainly when you were 
were stationed in Vietnam and other places during that war uh, were painfully aware, as most people were, of the reaction and feelings here back in the States. Were you exposed to any of that, and what was the general feeling amongst uh, your, your fellow uh, <coughs> soldiers and sailors as to the attitude back here compared to what you were trying to accomplish over there? It was very disheartening uh, to come back uh, from Vietnam into the environment because, uh, well, one anecdote uh, perhaps will illustrate it. When I, after the first tour, when I said, you know, it seemed like we were still trying to win the war, uh, I, I was with NASA at. Uh, actually with an army laboratory that was with NASA in California. And there was a, uh, a meeting in San Francisco of the uh, ordinance. I've forgotten exactly what the meeting was for. But at any rate, they asked for a military representative from the lab to attend the, uh, the meeting. And uh, the lab director asked me to go, and it was one of the dress blues and all of that uh, appearance. And as I was waiting to cross the street to get from the parking lot to the hotel where the uh, meeting was to be in dress blues, mm -hmm. this motor scooter came by puffing fumes and a scraggly guy uh, sitting on it, you know, and he. As he went by, he said, you fascist pig. You know, and that sort of, to me, typified right. the attitude, particularly in that part of the country. Uh, I don't know what it was like in other parts of the country. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it was as bad anywhere as it was in probably. Uh, well, I know from some of the, the interviews um, that looked at as part of our project that there's a general consensus from all of the, the Vietnam vets that it was a tremendous letdown and an insult uh, to be treated that way when they returned. So but, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know how bad it was in different parts of the country, but certainly there was there was a, a lot of poor treatment of the returning vets. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something which fortunately we're trying to react to and fix with the the veterans of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and make them know how much uh, their efforts are appreciated. I'm very cognizant of that because uh, uh, we've interviewed quite a few of them and I actually am friendly with uh, a gentleman who's been to Iraq once and is uh, set to go to Afghanistan this coming year. So um, I think that made a difference for them, a tremendous difference. Yeah, everything I read uh, supports that. Is is there anything you can think of, or anything <clears throat> um, beyond what we've discussed related to your your time in the military that you wanted to share? I think you were pretty extensive in what you covered. So. Yeah, I think so, and it occurred to me that uh, I do have a, a document which kind of summarizes uh, my. 50 years since uh, graduation because we just had our class 50th reunion. And as part of that, uh, w they put together a, a book. Mm -hmm. uh, each of us were asked to uh, submit a, you know, a summary. Right. And that might be useful and might cover sure. anything that uh, I've left out or glossed over or misstated. <laughs> I think, uh, I think we've covered everything, and I, I greatly appreciate you uh, giving us the time to talk about it. And thank you very much. Glad to do it. Thank you.